Shalom, shalom, chavrim. Welcome to Treasured Inheritance Ministry. It is myself, Aliyah, and today, welcome to this great teaching and this great time that we are going to be having together today. I cannot wait for us to just dive in to learning about today's character and also who, you know, and a little bit about who she was and also what we can learn from her life. Now, a number of prophets, as we know, are mentioned in throughout the Bible, along with a number of prophetesses. And that is so exciting because we see women functioning in that way and in that as today we call it an office, but it was very much just something that a lot of women did. And there are women that are named and unnamed throughout the Old Testament who were actually prophetesses. And in the following study, I really want us to examine the life and the person a little bit about the person of the prophetess Noadia and her connection to the land of Israel and Nehemiah because she lived during the time of Nehemiah and we know that many righteous men and women prophesied boldly in the name of Yahweh however some prophesied presumptuously and they were unrighteous in the prophecies that they gave and some of them were false prophets some of them were prophesying from their own hearts and so no idea belonged actually to the latter group of prophets and she is very very much in this frame of reference where we will begin to see that she wasn't prophesying right righteously necessarily but she is very important and it's important for us to examine her life as well as the impact that she made on the people around her and you know whether uh, or that impact was positive or not but how this really speaks to us because possibly there's a trap here that she fell into that really, really is something we need to consider and think about for our own lives. And I mean that very sincerely, something that I have had to reflect on for my own life as I've researched her life and spent a bit of time with her. I've had to think to myself, where am I standing in all of this? So before we get into this exciting teaching, this real life, really examination of context and culture during the time of Neil. Maya, let us pray together. Father, we just thank you so much for this incredible moment that you have brought us together for this time. And Father, we just really commit our hearts and align our minds, Father, with your word today, with your word, because your word is truth. And I pray, Father, that the truth will be spoken to our hearts, the truth will be spoken to our lives, that we will be led to examine our hearts and lives. Father, in this moment, in the season, as it's a special season leading up to the feast, Father, it's a time of examination. And Father, as we look at the life of Noah Dear, and we take it seriously. May we introspect and Father, may we look at our lives, teach us today, lead us today, and also encourage us today where our hearts are standing steadfast with you. Father, I pray that we will feel that comfort and the courage to keep going forward in the spiritual journey that we are on. We thank you for this, Father, and we welcome you into this space in the mighty name of Yeshua Mashiach, our beloved, blessed Savior and Messiah. Amen. So, 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 where do we find her? Well, we read about Noadia right there in Nehemiah 6 verse 14. And it says the following. Remember Tobiah, Sanballat, oh my God, because of what they have done. Remember also the prophetess Noadia and the rest of the prophets who are trying to intimidate me. So we have one verse. This is where we find her in this one verse. And it's this prayer of Nehemiah, actually. And if you have listened to some of the other teachings that I've done and some of the times that we've spoken on the Restoration Hour, you will have heard, and I spoke recently about Tobiah and Sanballat and how they abused Nehemiah from a place of distance. They were at a distance from him but they were trying to kill him and they were sending horrible letters and they were breaking him down and breaking down the work of the people. And really they were not great people at all. They were wicked. They were cruel. They didn't like what what Nehemiah was doing. And it's actually quite interesting here that Nehemiah is praying to Yahweh. He's praying to God and he's asking God to remember the things that these bad, wicked people had done against him, coming against the very things that Yahweh had placed in his heart to do and also here he says and here we meet her the prophetess Noadia and the rest of the prophets now the fact 
is she is named here and this is going to be something we will explore later on the rest of the prophets are there but they actually aren't named she is named so what, what actually happened what's the context i always say it's very important for us to know the context don't take things out of context so in the year 586 bc we know that the jewish people were exiled from the land of israel by the babylonians into the babylonian exile which i hope that you know very much about if you don't please go and read up about it such an important time in the history of the Jewish people, this metamorphosis that they went through, the temple of Yahweh was really burned to the ground while the walls of Jerusalem were destroyed and left to smolder in heaps of ashes. The Babylonian exile was intense, but the kind of the way that the Babylonians came against the holy city of Jerusalem and everybody that died, that was also very intense. So 48 years later, you know, once they went into exile, the first group of exiles return. They repair the temple, they repair their homesteads, and they begin to set up this new community of Jewish life. But it was under extremely harsh conditions. And then we have a further 80 years later. Now, people tend to think that this returning to Jerusalem, this returning to Israel from the Babylonian exile just happened. Well, actually, it happened in different phases. So we had this first return of exiles. Then we had a second set of exiles, Jewish exiles, that returned to Jerusalem under the guidance of Ezra the priest. And then a further 13 years later, Nehemiah himself, he returned to Jerusalem and he was he did this under the sanction of the king of Persia at the time, Artaxerxes Achashverosh, as we would say in, in Hebrew, as his Hebrew name is called and as the Jewish people call him, Artaxerxes of Persia. And it was placed in Nehemiah's heart to really rebuild and repair the broken walls of Jerusalem, which were forcibly t- torn down during this exile and the scorching of the stones so hot that, you know, there was not much there. It was just ruins. And Nehemiah's task was really a natural task because it Obviously, it had to be worked out in the natural, just like everything that you and I have to do. Our tasks are just so spiritual. You know, we have spiritual callings. So if I'm called to proclaim this word to you today, like I am doing, it's a spiritual call, but it's also very much a natural one because I have to actually physically sit here and proclaim this word to you. Otherwise, you won't hear it. And this was what happened with Nehemiah. You know, it was really this reality of saying, I have the spiritual calling, but I have to work it out in the natural. Without the walls, think about it, without the walls, the newly established colony of Jewish people that were living in Jerusalem, they were left defenseless in the face of enemy invasion. And I want to say this, you know, you had these groups of exiles that returned from Babylon through to Jerusalem, but they focused very much on rebuilding their homes and on trying to establish a bit of community and unity among themselves and also trying to rebuild parts of the temple but they didn't focus on walls and walls were very very important especially in the ancient world and the spiritual implication of Nehemiah's task it was an incredibly deep one and it echoes through to our day today which is beyond what we're going to be studying today but I do want to say that Yahweh himself placed this momentous task in Nehemiah's heart and he also blessed Nehemiah with favor and honor before the king of Persia okay because it was a big big task to return he returned on his own he had of course a few people with him but already there was a bit of an establishment in Jerusalem when he arrived and so there was a form of leadership that was there as well but things were a little bit corrupt and people were doing their own thing and we will see this in this teaching how this actually affected everybody and Nehemiah once he arrived in Jerusalem he said about repairing the walls he tried to encourage the people as well they were facing intense adversity and he was telling them to stand fast in the face of this adversity and although the community was living in Jerusalem and they were there they actually were struggling they didn't really have proper food supplies the mere the mere presence of the Jewish people back in the holy land invoked a lot of fear and a lot of hatred in the people that were living around them this sounds very familiar right because it actually is and a number of enemies rose up against the Israelites this included an Arab man that we read about in Nehemiah named Geshem also a Sumerian name man named Sanballat and of course this man that I mentioned an Ammonite who was living outside of the city his name was Tobiah 
And these men were really opposed to the building project of Nehemiah. They even went so far as to try and kill him in secret. And this was why he's praying this prayer that we have read about in Nehemiah 6.14, where he says, remember them and remember what they were doing. And remember how they are abusing me and how they are threatening my life. So here we have these Jewish exiles returned from Babylon and they are there and Nehemiah's task is monumental and he's facing adversity and they're facing adversity and people are threatening to kill him and he's really rallying the people. He must have been a really great leader because he wasn't only there to just rebuild these walls. He actually went about really encouraging the hearts of the people. And because he encouraged their hearts, they were excited to be standing there. But also they would put their sword on their side and work. And it meant that they believed. They believed that they could do it. And that should be what a great leader does, encourages you to do the work you call to do to the fullness of your capacity. Now we enter Noah Dia. Now, as I said, the presence of very different prophetesses are known throughout the, the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, although these are a bit harder to see sometimes, but they are there. And the Talmud tells us that there were very specific women that were actually designated as prophetesses, even though we maybe don't read that word about them. And, you know, there are many, many good ones. There are many, like I said, otherwise ones that go about doing their own thing. But I want to really introduce you a little bit to a prophetess that we don't know that much about. But in verse 14 of Nehemiah 6, Nehemiah prayed that Yahweh would indeed remember and deal with Noah Deer and the rest of the prophets who were trying to intimidate him. Or as some translations actually say, they were trying to put me in fear. Wow, that is very, very intense. Unfortunately, we we must say that the text, the Bible, does not actually explain why this prophetic leader was trying to harm the man that Yahweh had chosen to rebuild the walls. And there are two opinions that are offered for her negative reaction, and I want to explore them today with you. Because I think it's important, you know, we don't know much about her life, but we can look at her possibilities of why she reacted this way. It's too far, far too easy, I want to say, to just look at someone and go, oh, that's just a false prophet. She's not necessarily a false prophet because, no, you know, Nehemiah doesn't really refer to her as a false prophet. She's among the company of prophets that he's praying about. So what, what would this be about? The first opinion, and it's widely assumed by some scholars, is that Noah Deer opposed Nehemiah's wall building based on a false understanding of what his motives and intentions really were. Now remember previously, if you read the book of Nehemiah, Sanballat had actually falsely accused Nehemiah of trying to establish himself as the king in Jerusalem in order to revolt against the king of Persia. Now, this is something that was flung at Nehemiah, like you just hear, because you want to be king, you're establishing your own dynasty, your own reign, and uh, we don't like that. And so some, some scholars believe that that could have been the case. And we read this in Nehemiah 6, verse 5 to 9, where it says, The fifth, fifth time, Sanballat sent his aid to me with the same message, and in his hand was an unsealed letter in which was written, it is reported among the nations and Geshem, says it's true, this guy, that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt and therefore you are building the wall. Moreover, according to these reports, you are about to become their king and have even appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. They are to say this, there is a king in Judah. Now this report will get back to the king, the king back in Persia, so come, let us meet together. And then I sent him this reply. Nothing like what you are saying is happening. You are just making it up out of your head. They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will be too weak for the work and it will not be completed. But I prayed and said, now strengthen my hands. Sure, I, you know, there is so much to unpack in the book of Nehemiah. And, and I'm going to say this again. I have spoken recently about the book of Nehemiah on our Restoration Hour and I've done devotionals on this on, on our website. So go on over and look for the Nehemiah devotional on our website to get into this. Because this is so deep. It is so deep the things that they are saying. And, and we can't go into it today because it's not 
you know, what we are exploring. But it is a possibility that Noah Dia was moved by evil intentions and wrong motives to join with Sanballat in accusing Nehemiah of falsely setting himself up as king of Judah. So they didn't understand Nehemiah's point of interest. They didn't understand his calling. Maybe they didn't understand him. And Sanballat specifically actually mentioned the prophets in his accusing letter, which is very, very interesting once you consider Noah Dia's relationship as a leader among the prophets. She is mentioned by name by Nehemiah. He doesn't mention another prophet's name in Nehemiah chapter 6 verse 14 when he's praying against them praying against their works that they're doing he doesn't mention another prophet by name so it would seem that she could have been the leader or one of a leaders a one of a leadership role or she but she was definitely really really high up on the list and her name is mentioned first and foremost by him so it would appear that she held very much this position of leadership Uh, maybe of a school of prophets that was established in Jerusalem at that time. And Oxford scholar, and I wanted to say this, uh, Williamson, he makes an interesting statement, which I really wanted to include. And he says, it seems unlikely to me that the figure of prophetess was not so unfamiliar in Israel and Judah as our scant sources initially suggest. So what he's actually saying is that it's unlikely that prophetesses were unfamiliar to the people more than likely there are much more prophetesses than we will ever ever know about definitely we won't know about them this side of heaven so what this implies is that we shouldn't be uncomfortable or think it's a strange occurrence to see a female prophet leading the people of judah this has happened way more often than we have originally been taught and also way more often than we have actually thought of because not everything is documented and we need to really really open up our minds and our thoughts when it comes to this you know the bible is not a history book so to say it's not journaling a to z completely it's telling you specific things at specific times but there may be more things that were happening at that time that were, that were good and that were also bad that we just don't know about and so this is the reality is that there were probably a lot of prophetesses and some people would turn around and say you know you see the prophets were led astray because they had a woman lead them those who are against females in leadership could probably use something like this but that would just be a really really shady examination of the bible and it's also way out of context and it doesn't mean that she was the only prophet that was there it doesn't mean she was the only leader that was there and it doesn't mean that she was the only woman that was there it does mean that she was significant so we can conclude that it is possible that no idea for some unknown reason opposed the building that was set up by nehemiah and that maybe she misunderstood him maybe she misunderstood his desire to do this and they were maybe she was misled by the people that she was with or had good relationships with them and didn't want to destroy that however this was god's plan it was not a plan for people Her motives in joining Israel's enemies were wrong. Whatever the motives were, it wasn't right. The second opinion that's offered by Wilda Gaffney, and she's a Bible scholar herself, is one that actually makes a lot of sense to me, and and it's one that I think of a lot. And Nehemiah and his reforms, foremost, his reform, and we'll find that in Nehemiah 13, which I'll read to you, was a form of ethnic cleansing. Well, that's what we would call it today. And she states that no idea might have, and this is all just, uh, you know, kind of a theory, that she might have felt compassion over the woman and the children whom Nehemiah contended with. And due to her compassion and sense of feeling with them, it seemed right to her to side with Sanballat and oppose Nehemiah instead. And before you judge anybody on this, I want to say the following. I spoke at something recently where I had to speak about slavery. And it's not really my topic. It's not really something that I like to speak about because it's a very deep topic. But one of the things that I said there is it's easy for us to look back on people that went before us and to judge them. In other words, we can look at maybe someone that did something specific and go, wow, that was a bad person because they did that bad thing. All right. And it's easy for us to sit from 2000 years of history away to look at that and to oppose it. But we don't know what we would have done in that exact same situation. In other words, why would we sit judging people that have done things that we think we would never have done? 
perhaps we would have done that very thing that we are judging others for because we have to come back to our present day. And this is the challenge. This is the biggest challenge. It's a challenge to you who are listening to me today and it's a challenge to me. We cannot hold up a yardstick for others and say to them that you are wrong or to say that they were wrong if we ourselves might do that very same thing because then we are judging someone else but we are also then guilty of the same kind of judgment that we use against them. So in other words, and this is just purely judging someone from a historical level. I'm not talking about discerning sin in the camp and putting people out. That we have to do today. We have to put sin out of the camp because that's what the disciples did. That's not a form of judgment. That's called discernment. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about looking at someone like Noah Dear. We discern the fact that she was wrong here and that it was right for Nehemiah to pray that prayer that Yahweh would deal with her. That was right. What we don't know is why her motives were wrong. And what if she was moved by this ethnic cleansing? Now, I know today, let's bring it to our current day. Today, we sit in a place where we have the greatest refugee crisis in the entire history of human beings. We have this great refugee crisis. Now, refugees have been around since the beginning of time. And today, we have this great crisis. We also see a lot of times people judge refugees because Sometimes it might be thought that they're coming to countries. The media reports on the fact that they commit crimes, which is true. And then things happen and then you judge all refugees and then you go, all refugees are bad. And then you meet a refugee and you mistreat that refugee because, you know, you think you read in the newspaper or online or in the media that refugees do bad things. So you mistreat them. Here in South Africa, we have incredible xenophobic violence. This week, I interviewed some migrants that are living in South Africa who have experienced gross brutality and xenophobia towards them, even in hospitals that they've been in in our country, because of xenophobic realities, because of xenophobic sentiment. And they share their stories. Because why? Other people hear about migrants, that they're taking their jobs, that might be false information, that they're not contributing. Again, that's false information. All of these things, and then they judge that based on what they hear, and they mistreat someone else. But then it's easy to look at someone that lived 300 years ago who mistreated somebody else and go, oh, that person was wrong. But why don't you look at yourself? This is what I'm trying to say. It's easy for us to, from a historical perspective, look back at people like no idea and say what she did was wrong. And, you know, we judge her. But do you hold sentiments in your heart, perhaps, towards other people that are based on things that you have heard without examining what that person really is doing without examining whether that person really is called by Yahweh to do the thing that they are doing. You know what I mean? That This is what happens. We begin to judge and we judge no idea for the same thing that we fall into. Nehemiah 13, 23 to 29 says, Moreover, in those days, I saw men of Judah who had married women from Ashdod, Ammon and Moab. Half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod over the language of one of the other peoples. They spoke these other languages. They did not know how to speak the language of Judah. They didn't know Hebrew. They didn't know Aramaic. I rebuked them and called curses down upon them. This is Nehemiah talking. I beat some of the men and I pulled out their hair. I made them take an oath in God's name and said, you are not to give your daughters in marriage to their sons, nor are you to take their daughters in marriage for your sons, for yourself. Was it not because of marriages like these that Solomon, king of Israel, sinned? Among the many nations, there was no king like him. He was loved by God, and God made him king over all of Israel. And even he was led into sin by foreign women. Must we hear now that you too are doing all of this terrible wickedness, that you are being unfaithful to our God by marrying foreign women? One of the sons of Joadah, son of Eliashib, the high priest, was the son-in-law to Sanballat, the Horonite. The guy that's been cursing the people the whole time, the high priest's son, married Sanballat's daughter. That's crazy. And I drove him away from me. Yes, drive him away. Remember them, my God, because they defiled the priestly office and the covenant of the priesthood and the covenant of the Levites. Mm. 
So when Nehemiah chastised the people, this is this is really intense. When you know when Nehemiah chastised the people based on their lack of following Yahweh's law, we learn an outstanding truth. And that outstanding truth is that even the high priest who was serving in the temple of God had married a woman of foreign lineage. He's his own son had had married he had married there was a lot of mixing there was this this mixing going on and they had joined themselves the high priest family had joined themselves with enemies of israel and we actually learn in the previous chapters and i'm not going to read it here but they actually cleared out the storehouses of Yahweh's temple, where there's supposed to be grain and, and things stored, and they made room for Tobiah, the Ammonite, the other guy that's busy cursing the people that hates them. Clearly, the people of Judah who had experienced such harsh exile in Babylon because of the sins that they had committed before they even came, and especially, you know, dealing with sins of unrepentance and disobedience, well, that just not dealing with it they are just not dealing with things and they have so so such a long way to go in terms of repentance and in, in terms of mending their ways and dealing with the sin of marrying foreign women must have caused really great chaos and disturbance among the families of jerusalem because if you know no idea was opposed to nehemiah's policies it would have included policies that were about kind of breaking families apart leaving women uh, and and their children without shelter, without sustenance. They would have broken families apart and sent those women and children away. It could have been that Noadia's heart was moved by the plight of these women and these children and she would have made a perfect ally with Sanballat and Tobiah in the opposition of Nehemiah. Because essentially, you know, Sanballat's family would be sent away. Tobiah, you can bet that Nehemiah went in there and dealt with the situation that the room's that Tobiah was inhabiting in the holy temple of God. Well, you can imagine that Nehemiah went in and said, this is no longer the case. This will no longer happen. And so Tobiah would have been upset. Sanballat would have been upset because his daughter would have split up from, from you know, this one. And the, son, uh, the high priest would have had to send his family away. It would have been a huge split between everything and it would have made a perfect sense for no no idea to really join in with Sanballat and Tobiah and to really oppose Nehemiah. We have this progression of things that's happening in the city. And I really want us to think about this for a moment. You know, maybe you were reading this and you've seen this guy pulling people's hair out and breaking up families and calling curses down on people and sending women and children away. And in our modern 21st century thinking, this is definitely a problem. We would see this as a gross betrayal of human rights, but we need to really ask ourselves, was Nehemiah in the wrong? Was he wrong for doing this? And I want us to pause for a moment and consider what I just shared with you. Although there is a little bit that's known about no idea, if her heart was moved by the plight of ethnic cleansing, so to speak, as we would call it, was she right or wrong to feel this way? In other words, is it right or wrong to be moved with compassion towards people suffering, even if they are suffering for doing wrong? And we see this a lot today, people very much getting up in arms when anyone is put out the camp or when sin is judged and discerned in the camp and they're put outside the camp, just like you see with the apostles. This is what they did consistently. You know, Nehemiah is actually just following, he's like a predecessor of theirs, but really walking in similar footsteps. In other words, is it right or wrong to deal with it in this way? And we see that throughout the book of Nehemiah, it's the theme of covenant underlies the text. In the first chapter of Nehemiah, he begins his prayer by appealing to Yahweh to remember the covenant of love that God established with the Israelites in the days that went by. The covenant was based on obedience to Yahweh's holy and divine laws. And the Israelites consistently failed to love the Torah of a holy God. And Nehemiah returned to Jerusalem, although he's asking Yahweh to remember his covenant with the people, to bless the people as well, and to be with them and protect them and hold them and care for them and, and to really be with them. Nehemiah returns to Jerusalem to find the inhabitants are unrepentant and they are actually lost. And Nehemiah called the people to repentance and he set in motion three final reforms. And we see that firstly, Nehemiah ordered the priesthood to cleanse themselves from defilement, as well as to cleanse the temple of Yahweh from forbidden 
use. That was the first thing that Nehemiah went about doing. It wasn't just about the walls. He was doing a lot of other things. The second thing he did was he knew that one of the signs of the covenant was the covenant of Shabbat. The covenant that you and I understand very well. And years before the Israelite exile to Babylon, the people of Judah had neglected the Shabbat. Not only the weekly Shabbat, but the seventh year Shabbat as well as the year of Jubilee. And it was one of the main reasons why the Babylonian exile happened. Nehemiah knew that the people had to rent their hearts, confess their sins, deal and embrace with the signs of the covenant of a holy God. And he did this by ordering that the gates of Jerusalem were to be shut. And he threatened, again, they had foreign marketers coming in, trading on the Sabbath day with them. They didn't even honor the Sabbath day. I mean, they had all this other time to do this trading. And yet they invite foreigners in on Shabbat and trade with them. And Nehemiah knew that it was wrong. It was wrong to do this. And so he called it into reform. The third reform that he said about doing was it was of a paramount importance to the survival of the Jewish people. We owe him a great debt that he did these things, even though it's hard to witness. The people had forgotten Yahweh's law. They had intermarried with foreigners. And this was the sin that was first committed by Solomon And this was the reason why the kingdom of Israel split in two and why everything went downhill. What many don't realize is that through the intermarriage of a child of God with an unbeliever, many, 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 and it happens today, and I had this conversation with someone recently, many are lured away into the worship of idols and foreign gods. As we would say today, people skip out on their salvation. I've seen it and you've probably seen it and maybe you've experienced it even you think this whole idea of missionary dating works. It does not. And and Nehemiah is really teaching us here that when we date unbelievers, which is forbidden in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14 to 18, many eventually end up following bad practices or slipping back into the clutches of the world. And Yahweh and his holy law forbid the marriage of good and evil, light and darkness, holy and profane. And you can read that throughout Deuteronomy and in Ezra and in Joshua. Marriage between two people is a very, very serious matter in the eyes of Yahweh. It's not only this vow, but it's a covenant. It's a blood covenant. It's also a covenant of friendship. It's a soul covenant. It's every single level of covenant. It is there. And when two people are married, they become one flesh. This was instituted in the Garden of Eden. It was repeated by Yeshua in his ministry here on earth. And so it was the reason for Israel's downfall that they had this love of foreign things, love of foreign gods, love of foreign women. And I want to say that there are so many small idols that have been found in Israel today. If you look archaeologically, one of the findings that relates a lot to Israelite women is that there's a lot of fertility, small fertility idols that you would wear on a bracelet or around your neck or in your tunic that, uh, you know, shows that that Israel were always drawn towards the things of the nations. And this, we can understand why Yahweh did so many of the things that he does in his word. He's not this angry, vengeful God. He's a God that has a lover and a beloved that consistently goes after other things. Many, many people probably thought Nehemiah was a crazy person, as they will do today for those of us who truly stand up for truth, as maybe you've experienced. And you know what? This Nehemiah knew this had to be addressed. He said about turning things around through inspiring and also kind of probably frightening people to realize that obedience to Yahweh's word, even in the face of great loss, was where they had to be. Many, many people may have opposed Nehemiah, the reforms, the changes he brought about in the land, but these changes were necessary, absolutely necessary for both the physical and spiritual blessings and the survival of the people of Israel. My final thought to today is there's so much to digest in this teaching. You can just unpack it almost one by one, but my final thought is this. We don't know much about Noadia, but at least now you and I both know there was a woman named Noadia, and she was a prophetess in Israel. She was a leader among the prophets, which was not uncommon in Israel. She joined forces in opposing Nehemiah's reforms. She wielded significant influence over the people, so much so that Nehemiah prayed that Yahweh himself would protect him and save his life, his life from the fear that he was being forced to have because it was this fear that came through intimidation 
And especially when you have prophets rising up against you and speaking against you. And the final thought that I want to leave you with is this. Yes, she was there and she was significant. And in a way, we feel compassion because she, she might have been moved with compassion. But the final thought is this. And it's something that, like I said earlier on, right at the beginning of the teaching, I've been challenged on and have to keep thinking over even as I write this study. You know, a while back, I was approached by a lady from a local church community and she was collecting money for impoverished women around the world. And uh, I'm very supportive of the plight of women around the world in all of the things that I do on the many boards that I serve and organizations that I help. But I asked the lady about the money and the organizations the money was going to and she told me that they were going to religious Muslim ladies and when I asked if it was going through it, if it was going to be going through their church or if she would know it was given by Christians or in the name of Yeshua, the person said that no, it was just money that they're collecting from their church, but they don't want to push any kind of religious belief or anything down people's throats. You know, they rather just want to give the money. And you know, I this that's another conversation for another day. But our goal as believers and our commission as Yeshua followers is that we are to go and make disciples of all the nations. I don't, I don't always feel that, you know, if I'm going to be giving money from the ministry to someone, they need to know that it comes from Yeshua. If I'm giving money into a tin at a shopping mall, sure, that's a different, that's a different thing because it's just a tin there and it's maybe for the blind society and I put money into it. They don't maybe need to know, you know, I don't need to go and preach the gospel to them because it's going via shopping mall to someone else and the shopping mall isn't religious and yet they understand that. But if I'm giving money from a religious organization, but I'm hiding what I believe in order to help other people, then that's that's that can we can be on very dangerous ground. It's also for us who have a heart for social justice and and the plight of women, the girl child, or the plight of the suffering, the the plight of the oppressed, the widow, the orphan, the things that the Bible speaks to us about. And we have a heart for compassion over those things. We need to be able to fully discern when we have to do certain things and when we not have to do certain things. Maybe, you know, Dear's heart was moved by the plight of the women and children that were left destitute. But actually, this could have all been avoided if the men of Israel didn't fall into the sin of marrying foreigners. Because then no families would have been split up. These women would have married different people and their children would have been safe. So we can, you know, kind of almost pinpoint it back to an original sin that happened. And sin is always at the heart of why people suffer. And so you and I... We need to be moved by Yahweh's spirit to know when and how and if we are called to stand for something or to not stand for something, to give or to not give, to do, to not do, but to always honor the covenant that Yahweh has with us, the covenant that we live in in Yeshua, and always to do what he is always, always, always calling us to do. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for this incredible time that we have just to spend in your word and to turn it over. And as we analyze your word and reflect on it and, and learn it and teach it, we are challenged by it because it's a living word. And Father, we also realize there's so much more that we want to learn. So open up our heart to learn and understand your word and open up our hearts also to be people that are moved only when you tell us to move and to do only that which you tell us to do because we love you, Yeshua, and you are our God and you are our king and we want to be true to the covenant that we have in you so help us live that obedient lifestyle every single day we thank you so much father for your love and your grace your mercy and truth that you bestow upon us and we are so grateful for this we love you and we praise you yeshua mashiach we pray this in your mighty name amen it has been so good to be with you today here on treasured inheritance ministry if you want these notes, and they are much more extensive than what I read out to you today, what I was sharing with you, then go on over to our website, treasuredinheritanceministry.com. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel that you are currently on to get more incredible teachings. We upload teachings all the time. And so until next time, shalom, shalom. May Yahweh bless you and keep you and make his amazing face to shine upon you. Shalom. <music>